100 years ago, drilling for artesian water wasn't an easy job. The old bore drillers were as tough as nails. They used to work through 50 degree heat in the summer and freezing cold conditions in the winter. Well, when Dad and Mum started off, they would have had three offsiders for the driller. There would have been two drillers. There would have been the cook. That's just for the drilling rig. Then for carting water, there would have been two people carting water because there was no truck or centrifugal pump in those days. It was only tent accommodation at best. When my mother went out and first got married, it was all camp oven cooking. She had to make her own yeast out of potato peels and things like that. Now this is, an old, this is the steam engine that used to drive the, the drilling rig which is in front of us here. And when they were using it, they would have had to, very often, had to keep throwing wood about this size into it and then shutting it up to keep the power, steam power up. To transfer action from the steam engine to the actual drilling action, they used to have a, a wooden con rod coming down onto this crank here. And this crank turns all the time the engine's turning. And it goes on to that big walking beam above here, and uh, that gets the up and down movement. With such a vast expanse of water under our feet, it's easy to get complacent about conserving the basin. That was the case when settlers first discovered they could drill into the basin for water. They got a little bit overexcited and didn't really think too much about the future. Let me explain. Let's say this hose is the Great Artesian Basin and the sprinkler at the end is a natural spring. What would happen if I was to poke a hole in the hose? <laughs> I'd have water over here and I wouldn't have to go all the way over there. But what if I also wanted some water over here? Now, I've got holes everywhere, but I haven't got the pressure to get the water I need. This is exactly what's happening in the basin. It's so bad that a lot of bores and natural springs have simply stopped flowing. And hundreds of bores that do flow are out of control. They can't be turned off and they're wasting millions of litres of water every day. A lot of bore water flows into shallow channels dug into the dirt, which encourage noxious weeds and feral animals. And it's kind of pointless because the open channels or drains mean around 95% of the water evaporates or seeps away before it can even be used. Meanwhile, to make matters worse, a lot of old bores were poorly made or the casings underground are corroding so the water is escaping to the wrong places and damaging the environment. But there are things we can do. These days there's a strategy in place to fix up the old bores so they can be used in a sustainable way and the water can be distributed more responsibly. This process involves what we call capping and piping. Put simply, capping is just like putting a lid on the bores. Through a complex tap system, farmers can turn the bores on and off and only use the water when it's needed. Piping involves replacing the old open channels or drains with pipes. Now, the water goes straight to the tanks and troughs without being wasted through evaporation. And it doesn't ruin the native landscape by encouraging weeds and feral animals. It costs quite a bit to cap and pipe all those bores, but the expense is being shared by both landowners and the state and federal governments. It's not only grazies that are affected by bore water, it's towns, it's mines, and um, I think it's proving that water is a scarce commodity. The more we can do to save it, the better. And if the pressure in our basin is going to rise through a government subsidised scheme, I, I cannot see any reason why people shouldn't want to be involved in it. And so far, the overwhelming majority of landowners are saying that capping and piping their bores has saved them money and in many cases helped them make more money. Tractor repairs are way down because delving drains is hard work. You know, it's hard on the axles, hard on the... Uh, tyres, the tractor's in the mud all day. The pressure in this bore will keep the tanks full under its own pressure so there's a, you don't have as much electricity uh, pumping water. You can pump hot water straight into the house and do away with the hot water system. Uh, you can pump water straight into the garden sprinklers uh, once you've cooled it down. Also you can get a cool clean drink yourself when you're mustering. Come to a tap, there's a drink. On top of that it's just the fact that uh, you feel so much better about not wasting such a great resource. Of course, capping and piping has to be managed carefully, 
so that the water now reaching a naturally dry environment doesn't upset the delicate ecosystems. We started a program of capping the, the bores and that meant that we had to get the water flowing into tanks and troughs and we call them a closed system so that the stock can actually drink out of the troughs and we're not wasting any water. The government has committed millions of dollars over several years to help protect the Great Artesian Basin and the states are all starting to cooperate. And let's face it, they have to. Each state has different laws and legislations, but water isn't going to respect state boundaries. It just keeps on flowing. So, any plans to protect the Great Artesian Basin need to reach across the whole basin. The families that still live and, and um, earn their living in the bush um, just wouldn't be here without the Artesian Basin. <laughs> Committees and sustainability initiatives now focus on getting everyone involved. Farmers, local businesses, state and federal governments and other stakeholders. It's great to know that people recognise how important the Great Artesian Basin is to Australia. If you'd like to know more about the basin, check out the website.